Team's Principles of Marketing People. Back to the ongoing lecture series, Mark 3010. This is, this will be chapter one, excuse me, part one of chapter five. I misspoke. I apologize. Where we're going to talk about buyer behavior. Consumer markets mostly about buyer behavior. Sometimes people call it consumer behavior. And if you, uh, we have an elective in uh, buyer behavior, consumer behavior that uh, was taught by my able colleague who is very into the topic, which you have, you'll have the opportunity to take after this class if you want it. So with that said, consumer buyer behavior. We've talked the difference between before the difference between uh, business consumers and our business customers and and consumers that consumers typically buy a product or service to use, whereas business customers typically buy a product to go into as a, to be a component into another product. So we're interested now in you. Uh, you've bought something today. You've bought a couple of things today. I have. I bought uh, some breakfast at McDonald's and I picked up my dry cleaning. Now, we'll come back to that, but uh, the second definition is consumer markets are made up of individuals and households that buy or acquire goods and services. Again, the key is for personal consumption, right? So, um, what versus why? The what's we can get information on. I can find out, you know, what you buy and in what quantities you buy it in. But why do you buy those products at uh, Food City? over Kroger or Walmart and why do you go to that location why do you choose that brand at that location those are more difficult to come by and that is the crux of the money spent by business uh, studying uh, consumer behavior and consumer buying so this is the model of buyer behavior you see on the left side under the environment, we have uh, product, place, price, and promotion, which I hope you'll recognize as the marketing mix. Uh, and then we have other things, which we've talked about in previous chapters. The economy, technological changes, uh, social and cultural environment. That go into what the authors refer to here is a black box. Think of that as your brain. Now you know marketing and and other stimuli enter the consumer's black box and produces these responses on the other side buying attitudes and preferences when where what people buy however what we've got to figure out is what's going on inside the black box right or how are these stimuli that we're providing to the consumer resulting in actions that we want to occur. That is the trick. And marketers spent a lot of money and a lot of energy trying to figure out what makes consumers tick. So let's just take a look at this slide. It's three breakfast cereals. And you can see the question I'm asking is, what do they have in common? Well, all these are come in boxes. So, of course, that's not what I'm looking for. What else? I'm just going to be quiet for a moment. You can pause. Try to see if you can make a list of what they have in common. But I'll tell you, they're all children's cereals, in case you've unpaused or never did pause. So 
Why am I bringing that up? Well, let's see. Why is Captain Crunch looking down at me? I'm Dr. Brian Wansink from the Cornell Food and Brand Lab. You know, we've been doing a bunch of really cool supermarket psychology studies. And the most recent one we did looks at breakfast cereals that are marketed toward kids. Uh, I'm a big lover of breakfast cereals, and my kids eat breakfast cereals. But there's some cool things that happen in grocery stores you might not be aware of. First of all, in studying over 100 breakfast cereals in a lot of different grocery stores, we find the average child's breakfast cereal is sitting 23 inches off the floor. The typical adult breakfast cereal is about 42 inches off the floor. <coughs> Knee high to us, eye high to the kids, eye high to us. What we also found out is if you look at kids' breakfast cereals, their eyes almost always point down. In fact, there's about a four degree inflection point at which they're focusing down. Because if you look at adult breakfast cereals, they just look straight at you. One of the things we found is that if you have eye contact with something, even if somebody in a box, um, it looks more trustworthy and it increases your likelihood to purchase things. So what's the big takeaway to a, to a loving, concerned parent who wants their kids to eat healthy? Well, one thing might be just not taking a ton of breakfast stuff from the aisle to begin with. Pick up whatever you want while they're playing somewhere else. But a second takeaway could also be for well-meaning companies that want people to eat better. What they can do is take kids' cereals and use the same thing to make healthy cereals more compelling to kids. Put Scooby-Doo on a healthy cereal and have Scooby look right at him. Good luck and happy shopping. So this that's an example of uh, cereal companies who have studied, right, consumer behavior. Now, are the kids the consumers? Typically, yeah, even though Adults like breakfast cereal, too. But they have found out that kids, even though they don't have the money to affect the exchange, they are significant influencers on the, what type of breakfast cereals are bought in their home, whether by their mother or father, whoever does the shopping. So uh, that's just an example of consumer behavior research that, People do, and I'm sure all of those kids' characters looking down is not a coincidence because it's awfully hard to uh, create a coincidence, by the way. Uh, so, characteristics that affect consumer behavior. Cultural factors, right? We're going to go through all of these as we move along, but this is the kind of the model that we're going to be referencing, starting with culture and ending with, you know, the buyer. All of these things affect the buyer. To what degree? That's the trick. That's why research is done. And to different people, different degrees. And these are things that marketers can't really control. But you have to take them into account because they are affecting the buyer, whom you want to have as a customer and a consumer. All right, so let's start with culture. Now, why is culture important? Well, because it's probably the most important. It has a, a broad, and large, and deep influence on consumer behavior. Uh, you know, you, you're learning from your, your family unit or the area of the country where you live or the country that you live in from the time you're born and uh, they're very deep-seated in people and so you need to know what those are and try to spot any cultural shifts that you think are coming along for example I mean you know we've talked about the one thing that's certain in life is change you know you notice that uh, you know organic foods GMO free foods used to be a uh, you know, part of one aisle in Kroger. Now they've got a whole section with their own coolers and shelves and everything. Uh, just for almond milk and all that racket. Right? And, you know, when marketers saw this shift toward 
you know, health and fitness, you start seeing a lot more exercise equipment, you know, Peloton comes out, uh, clothing, you know, athleisure wear, uh, all people are on all sorts of diets and you see larger selections of those things. So that's, that's why you need to be, we've talked about it before, but need to be proactive rather than reactive and keep an eye on culture shifts. Now, subcultures exist within the culture. It could be a nationality, could be a religion, could be a racial group, ethnic group, could be a geographic region, right, where, you know, the Pacific Northwest versus the Southeast. Uh, I have a, a picture of a Jeep Wrangler up here. I have a Jeep Wrangler. And anybody that's ever ridden in a uh, Jeep Wrangler, mine has square headlights like that too. They only made them for one year, I think, maybe two. But uh, if you've ever ridden in a Jeep Wrangler, you know whenever you pass another Jeep, what happens? You know, they wave to you. you wave, you're supposed to wave back. You know, you wave to them, they wave back. Jeep owners have a little subculture amongst themselves. So, you know, it could be, let's say, you know, let's say the Hispanic consumers, you know, we identify as a subculture because they share a lot of characteristics and behaviors. But, you know, there are a lot of distinct sub-segments within that subgroup. You know, Cubans, Costa Ricans, and Mexicans are not the same. Perhaps they speak the same language, but, <clears throat> you know, people in Alabama speak the same language as people in Scotland. But they may not share a lot of things, so it's a lot of, you know, commonality. So it's important that you don't, <clears throat> you know, broad, broad brush paint a whole segment like that because Cubans are going to react uh, differently than our people of uh, a Mexican heritage. Uh and his, but Hispanics overall are typically uh, very family oriented, and they a lot of times they shop as a family, or it's kind of a family affair. Asian American consumers in the U.S. that's the most affluent U.S. demographic segment, um, and they shop frequently and are very brand conscious. They like brands and logos. Uh, so if you're you know putting together a campaign to target that group, uh, then you would want to pay heed to those. So within the culture, you have subculture. Social classes we have. They're everywhere, but more, more uh, stringent in some places or strident than they are in the U.S. And, uh, you know, the book defines them as relatively permanent and ordered divisions whose members share similar values, interests, and behaviors. Now, in the United States, you know, you can move, you can move up, in, up in social class or down in social class. You're not born into a social class and stuck there forever. Now, there might be impediments to getting out of that group, but uh, moving up or down, however you want to do it, but you can do it. Some systems don't really allow much movement. You're kind of born into a, uh, you know, I understand India is like that, you know, where you can, you're can you born into a, uh, a class, and that's kind of where you are. Even in the United Kingdom, you know, they make decisions about kids, I think, before they go to high school, around eighth grade, whether uh, one needs to go to, you know, learn to do something with his hands, and the other one is going to go, you know, earn a Ph.D. and, you know, quantum physics uh, but it affects buying behavior it affects you know if you take a person's what they do for a living how much they make what their education level is how much wealth they have and other things it affects how people buy uh, you know the uh, authors they divide up the US systems upper class I don't like that they use lower class because I mean we you know what they mean, but uh, upper class, middle, working, and lower class. Uh, so let's just talk about that as by way of income or wealth uh, instead of, you know, some other way. So put the lower 
put them in the lower quarter of earners and the upper quarter of earners. But why do we even care? Why do marketers care where somebody is or where they see they are? Well, I bet there's more people that play polo and spend money on polo in the upper fourth than there are in the lower fourth. So if we're going to be marketing polo related items, polo ponies, we don't want to waste time on a group that's not interested in that, right? So because that's one of the factors that can uh, play into what consumers are searching for and what they will have likelihood to purchase. Groups and social networks. You're in a group, whether you think you're in a group or not, right? And groups influence you as to what you purchase, where you eat, what you wear, uh, you know, the kind of phone you have maybe, or the kind of car you drive. You're a member of a group, and maybe you're happy there. Or maybe there's an aspirational group you'd like to move into. Maybe you're in the Kiwanis and you want to be in the Rotary. Or maybe you're in this group of people and you want to be in this other group of people. That's an aspirational group. And then we have reference groups. You're in group A. And uh, maybe you look at group C and see how they act about things. Or their behaviors are about things. And maybe you use that as a measuring stick based on what you do so you know you could you could define the group you're in now as you know uh, Dalton State uh, business students you know maybe you want to be in a the aspirational group is a you know you want to be a Harvard MBA student or something so you see at the bottom of the page there the well, group influence tends to be strongest when the product is visible to others the buyer respects that feeds into a concept called conspicuous consumption in marketing. In other words, uh, you know, you could drive any car, but you drive a certain car because you want people to see you driving that car. Because that has some, that feeds into your, some notion of your self-worth or your belonging. Or the backpack that you carry or the clothes that you wear or the phone that you wear or the brand of, you know, wireless earbuds you're wearing um, so when you can see it uh, group influence is pretty strong right if all of your you know if all of your either your membership group or your aspirational groups were in a certain kind of uh, you know winter jacket then that's a very strong influence you might also buy that winter jacket alright so those social factors have a affect uh, consumer behavior groups and social networks uh, you know this to be true just in your life who you're friends with who's in your social network uh, who never accepts your invitation or never invites you <laughs> right um, and the book I mean this slide mentions word of mouth and opinion leaders you know, word of mouth in marketing uh, is the gold standard, we call it. Because if a third party unaffiliated with the firm recommends a firm, that has a lot of weight. If your friend recommends to you a restaurant and you know they don't own that restaurant or have any connection to it at all, that's, that's very much more persuasive than is an, an ad pops up on your uh, Instagram feed for that restaurant. Same with opinion leaders. Sometimes we call them market mavens or, you know, influencers even. But in this instance, there are people, you know, generally within a reference group. And uh, they exert influence because they're either viewed as experts or uh, they always look sharp what they're wearing. So, you know, they must be... Uh, they must be really good at that. They must know a lot about it. Uh, and then I have a question at the bottom. How can marketers use these networks? Well, I've, I've mentioned several of them. 
uh, you know, word of mouth and influencers. You can see I have a Timberland exhibit up here, and that's a that's a social community. If you're a part of it, then uh, you know you wouldn't. You see Earthkeeping up there, and what is Earthkeeping? Uh, you wouldn't get in there and rant and rail about you know not not recycling. If your friends were members of that same network, you would make sure you had stuff in your recycling bin when they came over. Uh, so social factors and groups and social networks affect consumer behavior. Family, the most important. You spend your formative years within your family. And companies and marketers are very, very interested in family purchasing behaviors, the why. And uh, within the family, the roles and the status of different members so they can find out who they need to uh, reach out to, right? Uh, I mean, you're interested in the roles and how much influence the husband has, the wife has, the children have, the uncles, the aunts. Uh, because I'll just give you this as an example. A... Uh, not a he's not a friend of mine but let's say an acquaintance or a business colleague that works at Home Depot told me one time that uh, their store design group is mostly women that they design Home Depot stores for women now you think they design it for you know uh, contractors and landscapers or whatever but he said they really design them for women because that is those are the high margin things, especially paints and floor coverings and appliances and all that. They want it to be welcoming to women, not like a you know cavernous old hardware store that smells like old men. So that's an example of how Home Depot has studied the family and the the roles of the of the influencers within the family unit, and think how powerful. Uh, the family is on your own purchase decisions. I'm sure that you use a brand of mayonnaise or butter or peanut butter or you prefer a, one brand over another because that's what you grew up on. That's what your parents bought and that'll stay with you through life. Uh, so it's important and a lot of money and time goes into studying that age and life cycle stage right uh, that affects everything food you buy clothes you wear the furniture you buy you know when you're younger you know a mattress on the floor is fine and a bookcase made out of two cinder blocks and a two by four but you know you get a little older mm, that looks a little odd you walk into a 35 year old man's house and that's what he's operating off of uh, what you do for recreation uh, I'll change it and I'll take you back to, I think, chapter two, maybe. And I posted the uh, link to in the video explainer of uh, using the PRISM Life Stage Group uh, website where you could put in your zip code or any zip code and it would kind of give you a breakdown of who was living there and they'd given them all persona names and all that. If you remember that, <clears throat> that's an example of, uh, that's a tool that people use to uh, study those personal factors. Because, you know, a 65-year-old woman is interested in shopping for and purchasing different things than uh, is a 21-year-old woman. Right? There's some different places in life. So, uh, marketers and businesses study those so they can maximize each of those segments. What you do makes a difference. Affects the goods and services that you buy. You know, if you're a, an accountant or a banker or an attorney, something, what you wear to work is different than, uh, you know, if you work in the local vape shop. You know, maybe you're just looking to have the latest Hurley hat and the coolest nose ring, right? So we're not going to market to those two people probably the same products or services, or if we do, we might market them differently. So 
what you do in life as your occupation uh, effects has a great effect <laughs> on your uh, consumer behavior as does your economic position you know the more you make the more disposable income you should have uh, are you a saver do you save up to buy things or do you uh, buy it and then you know make payments on interest to pay it back maybe we should have a zero percent interest maybe we can get that sale now it's the same as saving up for it interest rates in the broader economy it's just common sense that economic uh, situations would affect uh, consumer behavior during the Great Recession. People weren't buying as much, weren't borrowing as much, and were buying what they needed to get by. And uh, and started really after that, started looking more at quality, see how long something was going to last. That's just as an example. Lifestyle, also referred to as psychographics, which we had a bonus question about that earlier in this course. Psychographics measures, looks at a consumer's activities, you know, what they do, their interests, and their opinions. So, uh, you can see this ad for KitchenAid, which makes appliances. So, rather than just uh, having the appliances there, you kind of have to pick them out. What they really featured is this uh, upscale kitchen area in a metro in a city you know high up in a building uh, you can see that through the window and this nicely dressed professional lady you know she is carrying a pot but uh, you know the appliances aren't really the aren't really the focus of that until you get down to the bottom you say oh kitchen aid right they're they're selling a uh, you know a lifestyle or people that use KitchenAid or, you know, you get KitchenAid and all of a sudden your life uh, turns into this lady. Uh, so, still on personal factors. Personality. Just in, you know, regular nomenclature, you say, well, you know, I really like her personality or I don't like his personality. Right? So those unique things that distinguish a person or a group. Well, Brands can have personalities. You believe me or no? These are some brand personality traits that have been that have been researched and categorized into five categories: sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, ruggedness. Think for a minute of a brand that you could fit in one of these categories. What's a sophisticated brand that has a personality of sophistication? How about a high dollar Rolex watch? How about a brand that exhibits competence? It works. It may not be the best looking thing, but everybody that buys it knows that it works. Brands seek these personality traits or they want consumers to view their brand as having a personality some examples you know ruggedness we've got Harley Davidson and Jeep right that makes sense sophistication Rolex which I just remembered which I just remembered which I just mentioned competence Volvo nobody thinks of a Volvo as the fastest car on the road the sleekest car on the road but they do view it as the safest car on the road because that's how they've built the brand. Uh, and you can see Red Bull under excitement. You know, it gives you wings. I mean, they sell it that way. And the Disney Channel, one of those horrible movies. Not the Disney Channel, I'm sorry, the Hallmark Channel. Disney Channel may also have horrible movies, I don't know. But I know the Hallmark Channel does. And Amazon. I mean, that's become a part of the language. So say, where'd you get that? Oh, Amazon. Yeah, just go to Amazon and get it. Yeah, because, you know, nine times out of ten, you order something on Amazon, it comes in a couple of days. Every now and then, not, but a great majority of the time, yes. 
So brands have personalities just like people do. And they, uh, they spend money to cultivate those brands. So let's talk about some psychological factors uh, without getting too deep into the minds of, uh, or into, into, <laughs> dug into the psychological literature. Uh, this 2020 is hard enough. Uh, motivation. That's the drive or that, you know, um, forces somebody to seek something. Perception. Just you should already know what that is, right? How you perceive something is how you see it. Learning. And then beliefs and attitudes, which, by the way, are very hard to change. But let's look at a motive, Right? Uh, we're going to talk about, we've talked about needs versus wants earlier in the course, but, you know, motives and needs sufficiently pressing. My tire is flat. I need to satisfy this need. I need a tire. Okay. That's a motivator for me. Uh, now outside of that obvious example of a flat tire, when you ask consumers, Tell me why you bought that. Tell me why you did that. Uh, oftentimes they don't know. Or they can't really describe it. If they could, this would be a lot easier. That's the reason we spend money on market research and researching uh, consumer behavior. So, a motive or drive is, is important. Um, this goes back to the hierarchy of needs, staying on that topic. Uh, you, if you haven't had this before, you will uh, in your principles of management or every management class is going to have it. But Abraham Maslow <clears throat> developed this pyramid, right? The trick or the, the idea being that you have to satisfy these in order from the lowest order to the highest order. So in other words, once you're physiological needs are, are satisfied you know if you're hungry and you're thirsty and then you get food and something to drink that's satisfied then you start looking for a place to stay and get out of the weather right and then once you're there for a little while you go I wonder if anybody else is around here because I'm lonely uh, and then you go I wonder if they recognize how important I am to this village right I think I need to be king of this village uh, but you can see from the inset box, you're not really interested in what other people think about you if you are naked, hungry, and thirsty in a field. You're interested in satisfying these before you move up to these. Okay? Same thing if, uh, you know, if a person is uh, living paycheck to paycheck or they rely on their paycheck plus a side hustle just to live, uh, they're not interested in really having a meeting about setting up a 401k or a Roth IRA, right? They're still handling their basic needs. Uh, and until those get taken care of, they're not interested in, uh, you're not going to, they're not going to be attracted to uh, esteem needs if they're still hungry and thirsty, right? So perception kind of know just commonsensically what perception is. You go, well, I perceive that to be good. I perceive that to be bad. Uh, we talk about selective attention, selective distortion, selective attention, uh, attention and retention. We'll talk about it in a minute, but it's the way that you organize and interpret information and you perform, I mean, you uh, form a meaningful picture of the world. That's kind of a it doesn't need to be that long of a definition. But it's the way you see things. It's the way you perceive them. And it's very important because if you perceive it that way, I can try to convince you otherwise, but it's going to be hard because that's the way you see it. Based on your life experience or things you've read or seen or other people's opinions. Right? So, selective attention is the tendency for people to screen out most of the information to which they are exposed. If you rode down 75 between Cobb County and Whitfield County, uh, you couldn't tell me every billboard that's on I-75. 
because you don't even notice most of them. Unless you're interested in something. Now, if you're interested or have been interested in eating at the Cracker Barrel, you could tell me where they are on 75. But if I asked you another restaurant, which you have no interest in, you haven't even noticed or paid attention probably. That's selective attention, right? You'll see a billboard for something because you are you might be kind of uh, looking for that. And that's the reason you remember it. You're exposed to it. Selective distortion is when people interpret information into a belief they already have. Right? So, you know, they they see some story and they they interpret that in some belief they already have. Even if it's new information, they might contort it and move it into some uh, you know, folder in their brain they already have. And selective retention is to remember the good and uh, forget the bad. So if you are a loyal Nike purchaser and user, and you might forget the fact that there's a story that came out that they used child labor in Vietnam to make those shoes. Uh, even if uh, Adidas brings it up, uh, that's called selective retention. And the, the reason that's important is because, you see this note I put on the bottom, we are assaulted with ad messages every day, on average 3,000 to 5,000 a day across numerous channels. So you come up, consumers come up with a way to uh, sort through those, pay attention to the ones that they consider to be important to them. And they come up, they develop these heuristics and uh, either that or you just be all day, you know, you couldn't get through Instagram or riding down the road or uh, all the signs on the side of the, the road or advertisements on, on you know, Twitter and Snapchat, and you couldn't do it. So we come up with these with these ways to categorize them. And the goal for a marketer is to break through that clutter with a message that is memorable that uh, people will uh, you remember and hopefully act upon. So beliefs, right? Uh, based on knowledge, you might believe something because you're knowledgeable about it. This product is better than this product because I know about I know them both. Could just be your opinion. Yeah, I think it's better. I like the way it looks, or it's just your opinion. Or are you just taking on faith? Right? That well, my uncle used to buy those. I'm sure they're still just as good. But what if uh, a belief about a brand is wrong? What might a marketer, why might a marketer be interested in that? Let's well, suppose a consumer has the wrong belief about a brand, that it breaks all the time, or that it's made, uh, in the making of it, they pollute a river because somebody told them that one time or whatever. Then you would want to launch a uh, a campaign to reset those beliefs and say that's not right here are the facts on that and maybe turn them into a customer rather than somebody goes through their whole life never even uh, entertained the thought of purchasing your brand or product right uh, and then last an attitude describes a person's consistent evaluations feelings and tendencies toward an object or idea I just don't like it I'll never use that because my ex-girlfriend used that and she broke up with me and I'll, I'll never use it. That's a tough one, right? So all that long litany of uh, examples and all those factors uh, go into affecting whether a consumer buys or doesn't buy, uses or doesn't use. You can see how complicated that is. When we start part two, we're going to talk about different types of buying decisions and how that works. All right? So, but for now, 
that is the end of part one of a very, I find, very interesting topic of studying buyer and consumer behavior. And I will see you back uh, in part two.